So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Bendigo Library. Bendigo Library stands on Jajawarung country and our staff and our clients pay our respects to elders past and present. We express our gratitude in the sharing of this land, our sorrow for the personal, spiritual and cultural costs of that sharing, and our hope that we may walk forward together in harmony and in the spirit of healing. My name is Robin Pearson. I am one of the team leaders at Bendigo Library, and this week is NAIDOC week. And the theme is Heal Country. One of the great privileges of my job was to join the gathering on the library lawn this morning and participate in the smoking and flag raising ceremony. The other great privilege is I get to chat to people. Today, we're, born, we're joined by Alison Page and Professor Paul Mimmon, and we're talking about this fabulous book, Design, Building on Country. This is book two in the First Knowledges series, edited by Margot Neal. We spoke with Margot and co-author Lynn Kelly last year about Songlines, the first book in the series. And so I'm hoping there's a little bit of a tradition starting to happen here. It would be great if we could speak to the authors of every book in the series as the um, series is published. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you could please keep your microphones on silent and turn off your webcam. It's a little distracting to see a whole lot of different faces, um, especially if people are from home and in their pajamas. Um, and rather than ask questions, could you type them into the chat and I'll pass them on to Alison and Paul. And if there are similar questions, I might combine them into the one. At the end of the session, we should have a little bit of time for any follow-up. Uh, so let's get started. Alison, I might start with you. Can you share a little bit about yourself and the experiences that have led you to this book? Well, thanks, Robin, and happy NAIDOC, everyone. Um, it's going to be, you know, every year NAIDOC just gets bigger and bigger, um, I think, which is testament to just how much I think Australians are embracing our culture. Um, it's relevant, I suppose, in telling my story in a way, Robin, because, you know, I, I started my career probably 20 years too early <laughs> because I think 22 years ago I graduated from UTS in, in uh, interior design and I joined Merrimack Design, which was part of the Government Architects Office in, um, in New South Wales, where they had Australia's first Aboriginal architecture group, Merrimack. So then I was working with Kevin O'Brien and Dylan Combermary. And, you know, I think a lot of the ideas in the book we were thinking about then because, you know, it was a very fertile time, I suppose, creatively. But then beyond that, you know, in, in doing work out in the world, you know, there just wasn't really the market for it. I think a lot of architects and designers really cared about what we were talking about, especially our mentors. Paul was one of them, um, Glenn Merkett, uh, Peter Stutchbury, you know, Rick Laplastria, really interesting people. And of course they were really into it. <laughs> um, but I just don't think, you know, uh, you know, until, you know, in our, in our business, until the property owners are on board, i.e. the developers, um, then you sort of really just kind of trying to fight for something that's, you know, you're too far down the food chain to, you know, for anyone to really kind of make it happen, you know. So for, you know, look, I must say for the first 15 years of my career, I was talking about a lot of things, you know, in terms of embedding narrative into objects, embedding storytelling and narrative into the design of cities and buildings and things like that. And I just feel, I feel like, a lot of it fell on deaf ears. Communities wanted to do it as well, obviously. So when a community like Wilcania was driving the design of their new hospital, we were able to really flex our muscles like culturally and creatively. And, um, but anyway, I mean, I, I, I moved, I became a real shapeshifter, Robin, because, you know, when you're running your own business for 20 years and you would know everyone living in Bendigo would know that when you live in the regions, you have to be a bit of a, a shapeshifter in order to survive. But I, I did end up 
um, just becoming more of a storyteller over the years. And so now the last six years of my practice has been doing a lot of public art and um, filmmaking. And so I, the work that I do now in sort of urban design is about the sort of convergence between a lot of different mediums, which I think we're really, really at the start of, but how can these digital technologies overlay with the design of physical places, um, you know, and the, and the in full integration of public art. So it's not just sort of like a tacked on piece of jewelry at the end of the design process, you know? Um, so uh, right now, like you're asking me at a really great time because suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, you know, in the last five years, you know, Australia, it's like we've woken up to the, um, you know, just to how deeply um, rich this culture is and how it really could be and should be at the centre of our national identity and what a great value that would be, you know, if this, you know, this is the world's oldest living culture that lived a very sustainable and very artistic um, existence and didn't actually work that much, you know, as in work, um, and even their work was boating and camping and fishing, which, you know, everyone seems to just sort of squeeze into the weekends now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, even the average Aussie, even the average tradie would sort of look at that and just go, yeah, okay, I get the value in that. So what and, happened? Well, what happened know. five years ago to, oh, what to bring this conversation to life? Um, I... I've, I've thought about that a lot, Robin. Um, I think reconciliation action plans have actually had a lot to, to do with it. I think the corporate sector has really driven this um, reconciliation movement in Australia. And a lot of, you know, it's like seven or eight million Australians were sort of forced to do um, cultural awareness training. But it's like, you know, a switch was flipped in their minds because a lot of them are really active, actively interested now. It's like they never really, because we weren't taught our true history, of course. It's all denialism and whatever. Um, and, you know, I remember remember Howard saying, oh, if you say anything bad about the history, you're, it's a black armband view of history. And so it's just sort of shut all conversation down. You, you weren't allowed to say anything negative. And so, and so that's what's kept this sort of, this lie by omission in a, in a weird sort of way over our kind of history and our identity as a nation. Um, but I think there's just so much more dialogue now. And I think a lot of people are just saying, well, you know, uh, there is this beyond the dots and beyond the dots that you see in the painting and beyond those symbols and beyond the dance that you see at the start of a conference, which is people's, you know, very shallow sort of uh, experience of Aboriginal culture, there is this world of traditional knowledge. There is this deep and very valuable library of ecological and cultural data, which really we kind of need right now. I love that you've used the word library uh, because as librarians, uh, we're called now to reimagine what library looks like in Australia. Um, so thank you for giving me that prompt there. Paul, can I pass it over to you? Can you tell us a bit about, about you, your work, your AO? Um, and, and what brought you to, uh, to write, to working with Alison to write this, uh, this particular book? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm a, a good deal older than Alison, and so <laughs> my story might be a bit longer in terms of time, but I should say at first that I'm on Yuggera, I'm speaking and acknowledge Yuggera country, um, the language group of the Brisbane River Valley and its basin, to the south of the Bundjalung people from the Logan River extending into northern New South Wales. To, north, we, to the north, we have the Cubby Cubby people on the Mary River and the Waka Waka people on the Burnett. Um, the place, I'm in a 
high-rise apartment, and this place is was traditionally known as Kurulpa, pa of suffix meaning place of the rat Kurul. Um, if I look out my window, I can see Binang Wurrung, um, the place of the crook, crooked ear lizard. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a story I can um, uh, unpack about that. But um, I guess by, I'm introducing the idea that we're on a, an Aboriginal cultural landscape, even in the middle of a metropolitan city. Um, to, the, to the north is the river, Brisbane River. And across the river is um, a dispute, a ceremonial dispute resolution ground, which, uh, which was attended by up to 2,000 people, Aboriginal people in the 1840s and as late as the 50s, 1850s, and, uh, and so on and so on. So I'm steeped in the cultural, the study of cultural landscapes. Uh, that, that came partly through um, my early in education and, and research in uh, anthropology, but I'm also an architect. I was an architect first. Well, actually, before that, I was a painter and a clay maker. I come from a long line of, of potters who go back to um, Bendigo in the 1850s when the Bendigo pottery was started. But as a as a teenager, I managed to win a scholarship to the university and um, I studied architecture. I nominated to, to work with Aboriginal people in Northwest Queensland and realized I had to reinvent myself as an anthropologist. I became um, one of the first consultant anthropologists in Australia. So I was an expert anthropological witness and working on the preparation of land claims in the Northern Territory during the 1980s, and then into native title in the 90s and the early 2000s. So that's given me a grounding um, of work all over Australia or over most of Aboriginal Australia. And in the architectural field, we, I started working in the reform of Aboriginal housing with the, Goth, with the Whitlam um, government. And um, I think all the Aboriginal housing panel of the Inst Australian Institute of Architects. And um, at that time, there was, there was no understanding that Aboriginal people had anything more than flimsy shelters and that they were sort of somehow nomads, which was the, the myth that had been perpetuated in, in the school books and in, in, in the history books in Australia. Um, and through my career, I realised that there was a much more deeper, um, complex knowledge about, um, about this area and um, a lot of understanding that needs to be gained. So I, through research, I started trying to apply my findings into design and um, from housing, realised that through, after the deaths and custody Royal Commission in 1991, had to move into the reform of um, institutional architecture, jails, prisons, courthouses, hospitals, clinics for Aboriginal people, aged care homes. And so there's a whole lot of work to do there, but simultaneously by the early 90s, I was teaching this, all of this topic or field of, of uh, knowledge and research at the School of Architecture at the University of Queensland. And, and bringing through um, researchers doing PhDs in this area who've since gone through to become lecturers at universities across Australia, but also bringing through young Aboriginal architects who are doing their degrees, the first ones in Australia. Um, so you asked about what's caused this chain, change that's occurred that Alison was talking about. It's um, as well as reconciliation, it's this... Um, feeding knowledge into the educational, the tertiary educational system and um, creating a whole new generation of people with a different way of thinking. And it's those people now who are leading this sort of um, sea change of uh, approach to Indigenous Australia and uh, bringing understandings of, of country and culture into many different professions and into the public realm and into all sorts of activities, even 
watching TV now on the ABC, you're getting told whose country you're on all the time. So that's that's a sort of a short answer to your que question, Robin. Um, some of the some of the listeners might have some more questions that they may want to ask you. Yeah, so listeners, you're uh, absolutely welcome to pop questions into the chat um, as we go through today. But as I said, there may be time at the end. So Alison and Paul, I'm going to read out this very, very, very long title. You're both members of the Australian Institute of Architects, First Nations Advisory Working Group and Cultural Reference Panel. Could you both talk a little bit about what that is, what it does, and what you each do within it? Alison, we might start with you. Well, Paul can drive it because he's actually the chair. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm, I'm the co-chair with a, a Palawa woman from Tasmania, Sarah Lynn Rees, and um, there are 14 people on the working group of whom nine are Indigenous architects or designers um, and uh, we've we've come together and of course they're all a lot younger than me so I'm sort of just a more of a reference point for people but um, we've been present well we've we've just done this at a time when the institute's administration the Institute of Architects administration are very receptive to change I've had a couple of goes. I've been on a couple of groups in the Institute before, one in the 1970s and one in the early 2000s, but neither of them came to any, any clear fruition. But this time, there's much more receptivity and we are being inundated with um, tasks and questions and activities. Um, and probably some of the main areas of work that we're doing is Firstly, we're being asked to rewrite or write additional practice notes, what are called practice notes or acumen for architects to guide them on how to design on country and how to consult with and relate to local Aboriginal people in their, in their design projects and developments. We're, we're being asked simultaneously to produce professional development um, videos and talks to more you know, enticingly engage people in the topic. We're, but probably one of the most important things we've just done is to in, write material and embed material into uh, the Australian Accreditation Council for Architects Professional Performance Standards. And these, these have been in, um, run by the, the boards of architects in all states. And there's been um, a an acceptance of all of what we've written and it is now part of the, the competencies that architects have, have to have to get registered. And in turn, that will filter down into the curriculum of all schools of architecture who will have to have their courses evaluated which, according to particular criteria that include um, aspects of understanding design on country. So that's a profound change in my lifetime, going from absolutely, you know, reading Robin Boyd's books in the 90, from the 1950s, in which he doesn't acknowledge that uh, there was such a thing as Aboriginal architecture, to a point now where it's being embedded in professional competency standards. Um, and beyond that, there are other tasks we're getting asked to, to do, we're, like we've already done a a preamble to the Institute of Architects constitution. And at this point, I'll ask Alison if she wants to add anything more to that. Well, I think, you know, the Institute quite rightly is responding to the needs of their members. You know, architects are being asked to do designing with country. It's not in New South Wales, it's like a legislative requirement for large scale developments to have this component, um, you know, thanks to Dylan, like Dylan Combermary stayed on at the Government Architects Office in New South Wales, while Kevin and I went off and did our own thing. But they, but, um, you know, you know, other states are, uh, you know, they're doing it anyway. Like, you know, so the, the large companies like Lend Lease and Mervac and all of these big developers 
uh, you know, they want this. So, you know, for architectural competitions, it's becoming, you know, a uh, point of difference. It's becoming, a, you know, quite the weapon. So, you know, that's good. I think that's healthy. I think it's, um, but, you know, even this idea of country with a capital C, mm -hmm. You know, because, because, you know, because the danger is, is that, you know, architects will just start to respond, you know, in a, in a sort of stereotypical way to what they think, you know, how you should represent culture, you know, and we saw a lot of that in the 90s and the, in the two, early 2000s with, um, you know, a lot of cultural centres using totemic references, you know, oh, here's the big Goanna and here's the big you know, whatever, or just kind of shape making, you know, oh, this looks like an Aboriginal painting in plan, you know, that sort of thing, um, <clears throat> which was just, you know, it was all, all sizzle and no sausage really in terms of what it actually means to, to bring country with a capital C, um, you know, break down that barrier between the interior and the exterior and actually bring nature and biophilia into the space, what it means to actually embed traditional knowledge in and around the building and create a song line through the building, essentially. What it means to actually think about truth telling and the memory of places and things that have happened, the historic references, you know, there's, the, the layers of story of the actual site and bring that to the fore and actually start to kind of talk about that in different ways. I mean, it's quite a, it's quite the learning curve for all of us, you know? Um, and, you know, I think this work with the Institute's really important because it needs to be led by Aboriginal people. It needs to be led by Aboriginal practitioners because you know, you ask somebody like Kevin O'Brien, you know, and, you know, and even me, like, you know, I think there's even a chapter in the book, you know, what, how I made so many mistakes, you know, I mean, I just learned the hard way, you know, by making dreadful mistakes in my practice. And so they're the sort of things um, that, that we, you know, we want to kind of share that knowledge with, with other architects to say, well, okay, if you want to go to a community and consult, then one or two days in the community is just not going to wash. You know, and it's probably better if you bring your husband slash wife and don't turn up as a single person. You know, you're going to be a much more well-rounded kind of, you know, expression of yourself to the com in the community's eyes if you bring your family, you know. Otherwise, who are you? You know, so it's just a totally different uh, way of approaching work, frankly. You know, and if you can ask Paul, I mean, he spent so much time, you know, in the communities that he's connected to. Um, you know, and me here, I'm in Gumbangi country. I should acknowledge the Gumbangi people up in um, Coffs Harbour in northern New South Wales. But, you know... Yeah, I've, I, I've been here for most of my life and, you know, it takes a long time to actually win that trust with community. And so, you know, you're always going to get a better result if you have that trust. But there are hacks, you know, <laughs> in terms of doing that, you know, um, there's, there's a way of engagement with community that is, you know, it might be called consultation but so, so, you know, in designing with country, you know, we'll have standards around levels of engagement, you know, it has to be deep and meaningful engagement. And I'm sure Paul has something to say about that. Yeah, well, um, just re trying to reframe it in a slightly different or a different approach. Uh, one of the principles in the book of Aboriginal design is sustainability. Now, sustainability is a, a, a word and a topic that's been very vogue in architecture. But when it started out, it was it started as environmental sustainability. Um, but that, that concept of environmental sustainability was more of an ecological approach, which was detached from Aboriginal culture. Um, but 
There's also now a thing that we're, we're talking about called cultural sustainability. So the challenge is to combine environmental sustainability and cultural sustainability. And in the Aboriginal belief system of the dream time, they're totally fused together. So your, um, your dreaming, your spirit comes from sacred sites in the, in the environment and you are part of that environment. So, um, and your environment is part of you. So in any decision-making, that there's a more holistic way of thinking. Do um, you want to add to that, Alison? Oh, absolutely. You know, like, so, you know, in, in, in our spiritual philosophy, we have a whole view of objects and materiality and we don't believe that there is any such thing as an inanimate object. So we, while in the West, we could, so it's a very different, you know, kind of viewpoint. And it's a total, it's transformational, um, a change in thinking, you know, especially for architects and designers to get their head around their creating living things. And that because we can all accept that a tree is living. If you start talking about a rock being a living thing, then everyone thinks you're just a quantum physics mad person. Um, but then you start talking about this, these objects, this book being a living thing and that it being a member of my family and that when I'm making it, I'll talk to it and I'll sing it into life. You know, that's a completely different, and that is all connected to sustainability because, you know, it, 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 you're talking, when you're talking to the book Ancestor, so we talk about a book, I keep making library references, but it's an accident, I'm telling you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're talking to the paper Ancestor, you know, you'd be talking to the paperback Ancestor because that's where it's come from. And you'd be talking about, because you've got to remember that Aboriginal people survived, you know, 65,000 years, you know, like major climactic changes, the Ice Age, et cetera, without the written word. So we didn't actually have any books. So our books were literally the environment. So all of these stories that Paul is talking about that were laid down by our ancestral beings, they left these dreaming tracks, which were song lines. They are all stories that have encoded in them these vast amounts of data. Like the, the average person had to, to know on average like 400 plants in order to survive from their local area. You know, that's just the plant world, you know, and then there's the animal world and, the you know, the seasonality and nuances of how those seasons change and how you've got to track all of that. And how do you write that down? Well, you write it by embedding it in the landscape around you. And so they, they, the landscape around you and all its materiality became mnemonics. And so when you build that sort of preciousness, because think about how valuable a book is, Think about how much knowledge is in that book. And so if, if somebody came, you know, so when we talk about chopping a tree down, you know, that to me is, is outrageous an idea as going into the library and burning the books. Because you could be chopping down a very important node within a network of song lines that you know, if you chop it down, that's all fine and well, but you need to replace it with something that, that re retains that knowledge. Does that make any sense? Um, so, um, so that relates, to that's totally integrated with sustainability because that is part of the reason why you have to care for country and connect with country. It's not just for the sake of, oh, we want to just be sustainable and we love nature and we want to keep it nice for everyone's enjoyment and just for food, like almost just in an effic efficacy sort of way, oh, it's just a functional thing, we need it to live. 
it goes totally beyond that because it actually holds the knowledge. And it's so it's it's vastly, you know, and Paul writes beautifully in the book about um, materiality and how, um, you know, all of these materials are sort of like um, body parts of the, you know, these ancestral beings. And so the materials themselves, you know, yeah, it's, it's probably part of the reason why, um, you know, Aboriginal people didn't, you know, they did embrace new materials, but it did mess up their whole, you know, they had to adapt their cultural stories accordingly, you know, when metal axes and things like that started coming into, the, into play. To put another layer on that, Robin, um, in the Aboriginal belief system, it, 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 it tells us that in the dream time, these ancestral beings sprung up at places all over Australia. So we, we have to get our head around the idea that Australia is covered in these sacred sites. There's some right near Bendigo where you are right now, and there's some near us where Alison is. And the belief system says that the ancestral beings left behind perpetual energies in those sacred sites. So those, um, it might be a kangaroo dreaming energy or a a Gwana woman dreaming energy or a yam dreaming, a yam woman dreaming energy, but what it, or a barracuda dreaming man, but whatever the case, those particular, those particular totemic or, or story beings left behind their energies. Um, the very smoking ceremony you went to this morning comes from a, a belief in the fact that there are coexisting spiritual energies in the environment. They're still here today. Smoking can be part of the process of opening up a site for a building and for um, bringing people into that building. So, um, and you know, G for Greenways, uh, Narara Place at, at RMIT in, in the middle of Melbourne comes to mind where they, they had smoking ceremonies for opening the place. And there are many other examples. The, the National Museum in, in Canberra on Acton Peninsula. So we don't necessarily all have to believe this, but um, we can recognise it and recognise that we, we, we are here in a, in a country that has a profound ontology and um, cosmology about where environment comes from, where knowledge comes from, the ancestral beings left behind these encoded songs for the, each site. And that's where the sacred knowledge is embedded. And that's, and then by singing the songs um, through millennia, that's where the library, that's how the library is perpetuated. <clears throat> With, uh, when I was reading the book, uh, I was totally enamored with chapter two. It so resonated the, um, uh, but just the concept of, of objects, even everyday objects being imbued with, with a spirituality, with an energy, with a life. Um, it probably, because it fits in with my very, very privileged middle-class hippie, hippie values, you know, quite nicely. <laughs> um, but um, you, you've shared quite a bit, of, you've shared a bit about that, but can you talk a little more about that, about, uh, you know, how, how, a, how a boomerang, for example, is not only a marvel of engineering, it's also a living thing. Well, do you want to talk, Elsa? You talk because that story about um, Jackson Jacob fits perfectly with the boomerang. Yeah, well, he was one of my teachers. And I, I write the book in, in, in the framework of, of my Aboriginal teachers who taught me, are all, all passed away, um, mainly through the 1970s and 80s some of whom were the last elders in Australia to live a traditional lifestyle. So Jackson Jacob or Donalgan Yard, and he was from Mornington Island. Um, and the Australian Museum wanted to come and make a film about making a boomerang. So I facilitated that. Um, and in that, in that film, which is you know, publicly available, he explains how 
this particular tree called the Gugaru tree, Acacia aleniana, the source of the hard wood for making boomerangs, was actually left behind by Tuatu, the rainbow serpent. And it's his broken ribs which fell out and grew up on the country to make these trees. And then there's a whole set, set of layers under that about the sacred histories of Thuatu and how he was um, burnt alive in his humpy by his sister over a moral um, set of moral issues and uh, how he metamorphosed from a human, a human state into a rainbow serpent. And in doing so, his ribs broke out. But he was also creating sites as he traveled, as he metamorphosed. And there are layers of knowledge in there about what he left behind in terms of a, a sickness and uh, that he, the people in Kerr, if they're, not if they're not behaving appropriately. So codes of behavior are embedded in the sacred histories of the ancestors. Um, uh, but Jackson himself, or Donald Gunyard, and he, he was seeing the tree as he took the timber out of the tree. He, he takes the timber out without breaking the tree down, but just out of the limb that he needs to take it from or the root that he needs to take it from. And he's singing to the spirit of the rainbow serpent. So he believes the spirit is still there in the tree and that the spirit can be, um, will be present in the wood that he's making the timber from and that he can, he can engage with that spirit to give that boomerang extra qualities. Um, you could say supernatural qualities. And hence, if we study the anthropological literature on Aboriginal trading in Australia, we find there were trading routes all over Australia. There were trunk trading routes crossing the continent. And there were many, um, you know, valued objects circulating and some of the most valued objects were, were, were particular artifacts which were made by these very knowledgeable old people, men and women, which had these spiritual qualities embedded into the artifacts through their understanding of the origin of the, the dream time and the origin of the sacred histories in the environment and how they could be inside these objects. Do you want to add to that, um, Alison? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's beautiful stories about, there's also a wonderful story about Frank Gorm Manamana from Arnhem Land. You know, there's a beautiful film at the National Museum of Australia where he is making the fish trap. And as he's making the fish trap, he's, he's talking to the um, fish trap ancestor. So he's going through you know, he's actually yarning with it. So sort of saying, you know, and then you created this water hole here and then you went over here. And so it's a very familial sort of like conversation. Um, but it, it's more than just, it is about remembering. It is about remembering those stories. And like um, Paul said, some of that is didactic. Some of it is about social mores, like how to behave, right? Um, and, but some of it is actually like knowledge about where to fish and how to fish and how to get the fish, which is sort of need as well to live. <laughs> so they're really, um, you know, and so, so obviously this fish trap becomes embedded with all of that knowledge. So every time he picks it up every single day, it's a repeated action as, as the same with, as you walk through country over time you're going to be reminded every time you see that sacred site or you see the, the mountain, the rock or the tree that contains that story, you're going to remember that, you know, which in the Songlines book, which you've all heard about, is actually a very effective way of remembering anything. It's sort of better than reading it in a, in a book, sorry to say. <laughs> but you should create a song line around your library. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Um, but yeah, I I think how you know, and 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 you know, there's other 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 communities around the world that feel the same way. There's Richard Lewaki from the Laguna tribe, and you know, I write write about this in the book as well, where he was repatriating some sacred objects from the Smithsonian, but he um, 
you know, he didn't want to take them back in the end because he thought the objects would be angry with him for and 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 his tribe for um, allowing them to be taken in the first place. And so they, because they would be angry, they would seek revenge um, on the community. And so it would bring bad luck to the community. So this, this notion of, you know, objects being family members is something that a lot of Indigenous peoples share. And it's for that same reason that materiality, um, you know, is, is born from their deep, cultural and spiritual beliefs but I think that we in Australia today can apply I think the same level of narrative the same level of story I mean I love the idea that that people are making things and singing them into life but I mean the reality of that in you know factories in China is very limited <laughs> but having said that you know what does that mean in a modern context you know can you still have mass-produced items that contain such a deep level of spirituality and story um, that they become these really super precious items and I think anyone in the room who's listening to this talk that has had a family heirloom passed on to them would understand that, yes, we as human, it's part of the human condition. We can, um, you know, we can embed, you know, as much meaning and spirituality into quite inanimate objects around us to the point where we will never destroy them. You know, we would rather than be passed on through our families for hundreds and hundreds and hopefully thousands of years because they have that same spirituality, that same essence. Um, so I think it's something that we understand more than we think we do. Um, that, but, but, it's, it, but it's an interesting idea for designers to start thinking about that in a more purposeful way when they are sitting at the drawing board with an empty sheet of paper and there's all this possibility about what could come to be in terms of their designs to sort of think about, well, how can I embed meaning into this instead of it just being a tool for living? So Robin, just to add to that, in the last 20 years, I've, I've become increasingly requested to assist in projects. And in the last you know five or 10 years, all the people on our Institute of Architects Committee are being asked to engage in projects um, and at the moment, or well, in the last two years, for example, I've been involved with the um, Cross River Rail project in Brisbane, which is six billion dollar one. And there are other big ones like the South Bank Master Planning. Um, in those projects, I try to secure a budget to engage a and bring together a group of elders and leaders and indigenous elders and leaders and scholars who act as an advisory group for the architects and then facilitate a crossover of knowledge so that they, so that they can brainstorm ideas for the architects to try to see how they might want to embed or, or create or somehow instill that sense of reference to the local and the regional culture in their designs. And this is the sort of things that the larger architectural firms are, are wanting now more frequently. Would you agree with that, Alice? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's you know, I mean, look, Australia, you know, and we, we, all we've done is replicate buildings from other places. <laughs> You know, whether that's sort of colonial buildings when we first were colonised or whether they're international styles. And it's all rather purposeless, you know. So I think, I think architects are very good, I think, at driving the idea of narrative. You know, um, it's, it's kind of approaching things. It's approaching a building almost like it's an artefact, really. So how you know, we've got to think about all of the design principles in relation to this artefact. And yes, functionality is one of them, but, you know, sustainability is another 
and aesthetic is another, you know, or in when I say aesthetic, I mean, you know, Paul writes a lot about the sound and the smell and, you know, like the reasons why Aboriginal people set up travellers camps were around a whole lot of different decisions. You know, all of those things a great architect can, you know, um, uh, you know, can sort of balance. Um, but storytelling being one of the, you know, more important and less, you know, no, there's not many other um, countries in the world that have embraced that as much, I think, as we've got the potential to embrace here, especially in terms of, you know, integrating song lines into schools and things like that. But but to do that, you need to have that engagement that Paul's talking about, you know. You have to actually, you know, talk to the traditional owners, you know. And I think a lot of, there's a lot of architecture firms that are just getting their head around that really, you know, but it's not easy. Yeah, there's, um, when, you, when we think about projects in the library, we think about deadlines and costs and, you know, what has to be done to get, get it across the line and make everybody happy. And uh, engagement, even you know, if, even in in our profession, engagement is so often about getting through a checklist so you can get on with it, um, and and that's where we really need to need to shift because it's a huge expense in time, and Westerners are quite foolishly precious about time, aren't we? Yeah. I agree. Um, that's what Alison was alluding to when she said you go to consult with a, a community, you go there with a, in a different with a different concept of time and a different concept of relationality, um, bringing your extended family with, with you and um, trying to work out how you position yourself in relation to those peoples. So the word... Um, Relational is often used in reference to Aboriginal culture. It means a high quality of interrelation with the people in the in the society, but also with the environment. Um, and that all those things are intertwined through this basic belief system and kinship and uh, social divisions and knowledge of dreamings and the country. Uh, we got any good questions from our listeners yet, uh, Robin? <laughs> We've got a lot of comments, but they're, 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 not, they're not questions. Um, but Paul and Alison, can you expand on, on, um, on shelter, home kin and kinship and, and how that influences design in um, First Nations communities? Because um, there's a lot of it in the book. Yeah, well, uh, home... In an Aboriginal sense, home is is country, really. Home is country. So, uh, in the in the classical lifestyle, the hunter gatherer lifestyle, uh, someone might want to ask a question about the Pasco Sutton debate <laughs> that's going on at the moment. But in those classical hunter gatherer lifestyle, in your home country, you usually had a repertoire of campsites. And they were used at different times of the year for different seasonal and social reasons and to, to harvest different types of resources. So people moved between in a particular pattern between it might have been six or eight or 10 or 15 campsites. And all of those places together become the home. Um, there's a debate about whether some groups had more sedentism than others and, and developed villages. So I, I wrote a, a quite a big book called Gunny Gundi and Worley, which I hope is in your library, which won three national prizes on the traditional shelters and architecture of Aboriginal Australia. And in that, I introduced the idea that where there were areas in Australia with um, very inclement weather, but simultaneously abundance of food resources that, that's where you had a more, more village life happening and more sedentism happening. And if we look at the weather map this morning, we see that big cold, uh, that big low coming over the southwest of WA and it's going to 
hit into Gundijmara country in Western Victoria soon. Those are the places where, in the west coast of Tasmania, where we get these areas where we get more permanent shelters, such as the stone um, buildings of the Gundijmara. So, um, but yeah, but by and large, most groups were, were fairly mobile, but with a very strict um, pattern of uh, movement with, on, their, on their countries. And for them, that was home. And family was the extended family of the camp. And in the kinship system, kinship, the, the Aboriginal kinship system is different to Anglo-Celtic, but even accepting that, over, overlaid on top of that is a, is a, um, a social, a social um, skin system or a class system where everybody becomes related through particular skin systems. They vary across the continent. Um, from area to area, but it meant that we people had classificatory relationships with people. They weren't necessarily related through blood or through marriage. So, um, but, but certainly some of these, you know, I really liked when I read it in the book, Paul, that you wrote about how, you know, people didn't, Aboriginal people weren't really obsessed with kind of decorating their homes and, you know, like as much as we are now, like, so, you know, obviously as human beings, we want to express ourselves in, the, in our environments. And so for Aboriginal people, what Paul is saying is that that was a cultural landscape that was quite broad, that, you know, fit in their language area, you know, or beyond even sometimes depending on what kin they were related to, you know, it might be their mother's country or their grandmother's country or et cetera, et cetera, like be quite complex and quite over vast distances. And their identity is literally written in, you know, in the landscape. But it's not about the individual, obviously, they're just playing a part. They're a tiny dot in the big scheme of, you know, um, the care for country. Whereas we sort of have this obsession with our, well, with real estate, frankly, and with our little house and renovating our little houses and making sure that we they look like galleries and that we're pieces of artwork that just float around in them and, you know, <laughs> and that we we express ourselves as much as possible. And, you know, it's a, it's a sad indictment in a way on society that we, that's the only power that we we have as individuals and as families, as nuclear families, is to express ourselves within these four walls, you know, these little boxes, um, rather than on a much broader and much more communal level, you know, which would, would take us out into the street and out into the town and into the public realm, you know. But a lot of Australian cities are ugly. I live in Coffs Harbour and it's ugly. It's in this amazing, beautiful, natural landscape, but everything built here is pretty ugly. And it's it, the decisions are just bad, <laughs> you know, on so many levels and there's no accountability. And so I can understand why the people of the town for decades and decades and decades have you know, they just don't feel like it's their, it's theirs. They don't feel a sense of belonging there because there's no connection to it. They don't want to be connected to it. It's disgusting, you know, like in terms of what it represents. It's just commercialism. It's shopping malls and, you know, little t tiny ticky tacky homes that have, you know, it's just some developer who's trying to maximise the amount of, that doesn't represent me and who I am and what I believe in. Like it's revolting. Just to add to that, um, in the book I write about travelling with groups of old people and then the meticulous um, set of choices they have in terms of selecting where we're going to camp for the night. And then once we've camped at a particular site with a particular set of attributes and we've got what we need for comfort, which is fire and a cleared soft ground to sleep on and other sensory inputs the old old men in the in the in the company with us will start to tell the country call the country and um, talk about the cultural landscape all of the places that are around us the sacred 
histories for the places that are around us, the living memories of and incidents and um, that have occurred in the country around us. And there comes from that a security of being in country and the concept that the country can be kind. There's a kindness coming from country. People feel well connected. And this comes back to what Alison's talking about, connectedness to country. Um, and those things are just probably more important than putting an embellished symbol on a house. Even though some, some traditional shelters did have symbols embedded into them uh, because they were related to certain sacred histories. But by and large, um, as Alison said, most shelters weren't. I think, um, you know, I just sort of looking at some of these questions here, but I just think, you know, um, there's there's a question here about how can we move beyond the rhetoric and tokenism and, and have a way that, you know, public buildings, you know, can fully integrate country. And the answer to that question, you know, is an expansion of what we're talking about. I think in Australia right now, I think there is the will, but where we're at at the moment is that it's more in relation to large cities. So the best examples of designing with country are happening in Sydney and Melbourne and, you know, pockets of Brisbane and, you know, like the majors, the major cities. I think we've got the potential to see a lot of change um, with this designing with country legislation, connecting with country legislation in New South Wales. But what I, what I really think needs to happen is that we need to get to the local councils of all the little towns and cities across Australia, because that's really where we sort of expect big cities. You know, it's the same with the environmental movement. It all started with large architectural firms getting their head around it. You know, it was legislated, they were forced to do it. So they got their head around it. And now it's sort of just part of the everyday of design. Like it's expected and it's done very well, actually. Um, I think we're, we're very much at the early stages of black design. And but when I mean that, it's not just about exclusivity. This is about creating public spaces and buildings you know, we should have buildings with forests planted in them where we part of the experience of that forest is, you know, being able to care for those trees, you know, in artistic and beautiful and ritualistic ways, you know. Um, but that should be happening. You know, my big thing is, you know, I think it should be happening in regional areas like Bendigo or Coffs Harbour or, you know, Ballarat because I think... You know, that's where we're actually going to see tangible change. So the Institute's, you know, probably got a lot of work to do there, Paul, in terms of actual, you know, just informing local councils and their planning kind of regulations and what to expect from, you know, um, these developers. Because we think of developers as big, big conglomerates. They're not. Developers these days are mum and dad baby boomers who have done really well in the real estate game and they're just decide, they're just doing a set of six townhouses down the road, do you know? And they're just using fibre cement sheeting because they have no architectural skill. They use Bob, their friend, who's done a bit of architecture in the 70s and she, you, you know what I mean? And so for, for, I'd love for them to all read the book and try and get their head around this and actually care about it because that's where I think we'll see real change. We've had, um, you've, you've touched a chord with the audience. We've suddenly got a whole pile of questions, so, <laughs> which is great. Um, so somebody's looking for some examples. Um, contemporary large public commercial buildings um, that you see as exemplars in, um, in the context of, um, of the book and what's it about. Anything we can go and have a look at. Well, I mentioned the Narara place at RMIT in Melbourne. Um, one of the earlier, one of the more successful early attempts was the Bramber Cultural Centre um, in Western Victoria, um, in the Grampians. Um, 
So there, there's two in Victoria. Uh, uh, Ke Kevin O'Brien's work, um, which you can find online, like any of his stuff, I think is really, really. And it, you know what I really love about Kevin's work, especially a temporary um, pavilion that he designed called Black Box, is that it it doesn't look typically what you would expect. You know, Kevin's work almost challenges this idea that, um, you know, Aboriginal aesthetic is all squiggles and dots. You know, a lot of his stuff is quite modernist architecture, but it has in it, like his um, Casino Medical Centre project, for instance, a lot of it has a deep philosophy embedded into it. I mean, he's framing, you know, in the Casino Medical Centre, he's actually framing, you know, views of the church across the road as sort of a, a cheeky sort of, um, you know, nod to sort of the, uh, you know, um, you know, the, like the Catholic Church and their, their role in kind of, you know, squashing a lot of Aboriginal cultural practice, you know, but also creating a sustainable building as a building that has all of this biophilia for, you know, staff, so for their well-being. Um, you know, I think one of the best examples is the building that Merrimart designed, you know, Dylan and Kevin, you know, largely designed it. And it was in the late 90s and it was the Wilcannia Hospital because they, they worked with the community for seven years in the creation of it. The elders became an incorporated body. So they, they then stayed on. I mean, I think they still in, exist today as, a, as an entity. Um, and the building was, um, was talked about like it was a living being. It was party, the river cod. The building doesn't look like a cod. It's not the big cod, but certainly when we when you start to talk about some of the architectural language looks a bit like skins and fins, and you know, there's there's philosophies around how the well-being of people sleeping in the hospital, you know, should face the river, you know, so it addresses those issues. It does a lot of stuff around sorry business in terms of how the mortuary works. And, you know, one of the best things is that the building was made of a stabilised earth brick, um, which was, you know, what the, you know, the community actually started a company to make those bricks. And so six Aboriginal apprentices were um, trained in the building of it. So they were able to, um, so, you know, it was literally built of their own, like, soil but they were able to maintain the building as well. So what didn't have this whole thing of, you know, oh, let's go and build great buildings in remote Aboriginal communities and then they just fall apart over time because no one's trained to fix it. Whereas, you know, it had the building had these custodians almost, you know, built into the process. Um, you know, for me, a lot of these projects, you've got to deliver more than bricks and mortar. You know, you have to have, you know, the, a project like that, you know, your multi-million dollar building in a remote community has to deliver more than just the building itself. Um, it has to have these employment opportunities. It has to have this ongoing, you know, engagement um, that, you know, could turn into an incorporated entity. So, you know, it's how can you add those layers of, um, you know, um, it, what is the object, you know, it, it, it's more than just the physical building that you're leaving behind as, as, a, as an artist or, you know, I say an artist, uh, you know, as an architect. Another example to keep, keep in mind is the Gundij Mara Cultural Centre that's been built, but it hasn't been opened yet. So I think it's, the, the opening's been delayed by COVID, but um, in Western Victoria, so it's likely to be opened by the end of the year. Also keep an eye on Melbourne University campus where our colleague Jeffrey Greenway is um, involved in the, in the landscape, urban design and landscape planning, and they're revitalising uh, a creek that, that flows into the Yarra, I think, which, um, was a traditional eel catching creek and 
referencing that, embedding that back into the landscape of the Melbourne University campus. So that's another example to keep an eye out for in Victoria. And I think Barangaroo in Sydney is a really great example of how um, art and storytelling um, has been embedded. Is it a perfect project? No. It hasn't got all of the elements. Like, to be honest with you, I, look, there's a few competitions going on at the moment that I think, wow, this is a really great example. So I don't think that there are great, you know, there's pockets of, 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 of connecting with country, you know, but is there projects that have it all? Um, yeah, but not maybe not on an urban design scale just yet. But I think developers to watch are people like Lynn Lease. And I think Infrastructure New South Wales, I mean, because they've got this legislation that they're pushing themselves. And I think Rob Stokes, the Minister for Planning, he's really drunk the Kool-Aid. He's really into it. And he, and, and if you've got decision makers and leaders at that level that are pushing it, then it's going to happen. But, you know, I mean, everybody does want to sit, you tell us how to do it. Tell us how to do connecting with country. Um, show us the examples and we'll just, you know, sort of follow suit and copy that. It's not really how it works. Mm -hmm. It's more of a process than a product. So, you know, the, the product itself, you know, you might sort of go, oh, okay, I didn't expect to sort of see that in terms of, you know, this is the result of it. Um, but behind the scenes, you know, the process was quite culturally appropriate and amazing, but, you know, like um, in a society that's driven by, you know, bling, I suppose we, want, we just want to see the examples of what, you know, show us the best, what does it look like? <laughs> But, you know, like that's why Dylan's been very um, adamant about saying, okay, here's the destination, you know. This is where we all want to head. We want a, we want a nation that, you know, uh, where we have, you know, we can have um, a greater connection with nature, even in the middle of the city. We want storytelling. We want art and storytelling integrated into um, the, the built environment much earlier in the process than what it is now and in a much more meaningful way than what it is now. And it's called public art when it's actually much more beyond that. We want truth telling in the environment. We want um, traditional knowledge embedded into the environment, you know, all, all of these things, is sac is sacred sites, the memory of places, all talked about. So Dylan's just said, this is where we're all headed, but we're all in different cars heading there. And, you know, I think he's open to seeing what, you know, wh what this creative community in terms of architects can come up with. So that's why he won't be there are a few case studies, you know, some of the ones that we've mentioned in the Connecting with Country um, discussion paper. But, you know, we want to see more, um, we want to see this envelope pushed even further. You know, for my, for my, for my, look, for my, I'm an artist, right? So I do a lot of, um, you know, I do filmmaking, I do, public art, et cetera, et cetera. But some of my, I would like my materiality to be grown. I would like some of my stories to have grown elements to it. And the only way to make that happen is to have landscape architects, architects, property owners, curators, this whole tribe of different practitioners working together on day one, like when there's a blank sheet of paper with elders as well, like, that's a totally different process to how things are done now, you know, so that, so that a public artwork can be something that's grown. You got another question there, Robin? No, I'm just in awe of what Alison just said. Um, with the, uh, like, I, I see a potential for, for spaces, um, for shared spaces in Australia, not just... Um, um, not spaces that aren't 
um, either indigenous community spaces or um, colonial spaces, but where the whole story of the um, of space is discussed and and becomes part of you know what we call the built environment. Um, and I think, and then I think about my tiny little farm with my ancient schoolhouse on it, <laughs> where I grow my apple trees. I think, boy, I've got some work to do. <laughs> um, the end vision, you could say, is a, is a, it's an it's an environment that that not only protects and is kind, but also educates mm -hmm. and and brings a sense of all Australians in it in an inclusive way, with a sense of pride about. The national history and culture of the land here in the country. Um, that's the big vision. How, you know, how do we embrace that? We, there's no point in copying American architecture or European architecture or Singaporean architecture. How do we? How do we develop a genuinely authentic Australian architecture that draws fully on our traditions? and has an educational and identity role of uniting people together in an inclusive way. And, 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 and gives and, and fills people with a compulsion to care for country. Like not just, you know, there's this great story that, you know, Bill Gamage writes about in The Biggest State on Earth and I love it. And it's about this Tasmanian warrior, warrior um, Manalagana, who during the, the Black War, you know, where basically anyone in, in Tasmania in the 1830s or whatever it was, they would, it was um, martial law, so you could just go and shoot a black. Anyone could do it. It was totally legal, you know. And so Manalagana, he was, he had a, a small group, this is in the Ben Lomond sort of area, but he had a small tribe that he was trying to protect. And he was, he was really good at it, but he's, he's getting away from this, um, from, from this group of, of bandits and he stops to burn country on the way, you know, um, which eventually gave his location away and, you know, he was caught. But what I love about that story is that his compulsion to care for country was so strong that he valued country over his own life. So imagine if we could get to a place in Australia where country was so kind to us and was so embedded in our everyday environments that we had to care for it in return. I think given the theme this week of, of healing country, you know, that that can happen within a built environment. The built environment has a role to play in healing country because as Dylan Combermary says, you know, we have to think about how buildings behave. Well, we have gone 15 minutes over time. Um, so uh, I would just like to thank you both. Um, the book it's in our library you will have to reserve it because the first knowledge series are popular so there'll be plenty of people reading it and thinking about it in Bendigo um, over the next few weeks so hopefully you've planted you've certainly planted a seed in my mind but you've planted a seed which those of us who have a little power to go and advocate to our councils and those librarians who can jump up and down and speak to those people who give us money and say, hey, Alison told us we've got to put a song line through this place, um, which I'm so going to my next meeting. <laughs> That's precisely what I'm going to do. Uh, you've really given us some information to take away and process. And so I thank you both. Um, and I'll let you get back to your lives. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.